Hey everybody, Gary Edelman, American Battlefield Trust. We're happy to be here live from Gettysburg, Gettysburg 157, and here we are on Barlow's Knoll. I guess you can probably see that. Uh, this is a less visited part of the battlefield, but very important, and for, certainly for the thousands of troops who fought here, this was Gettysburg for them. For many of them, this was their Gettysburg experience. And just to tie it together here, before we bring on some of our uh, several guests on this particular uh, live, is that you know we are about a half mile to a mile north of town, um, over cameraman Dan Davis's shoulder I would be looking back toward seminary and Oak Ridge and on the morning of July 1st 1863 the fighting had eventually pushed through McPherson's woods over the ripple and back to seminary Ridge uh, during that time the Confederates also occupied Oak Hill at the northern extension of the ridge and pushed down toward that and in the meantime this was all first Corps fighting until the 11th Corps arrives we're gonna turn it over to Chris Gwynn uh, he runs interpretation here at the Gettysburg National Military Park during this strange socially distant um, anniversary. Thanks for being here, Chris. Yeah, Gary, thank you very much. Thank you to the ABT for having me and for being here on the battlefield for the 157th anniversary. Uh, we're so appreciative of all the work the ABT does to help organizations like the National Park Service preserve places like this, Gettysburg. And as Gary mentioned, we're on a less visited spot on the battlefield, but it also happens to be one of my favorite spots, uh, of course, Barlow's Knoll, as, as Gary just mentioned. North of the town of Gettysburg, there's this area that is often referred to as the Gettysburg Plain. It's relatively flat land, it's relatively nondescript. The only real elevation is where we are here on Barlow's Knoll, and it's bisected by three roads. To the west is the Mumisburg Road, in the center is the Carlisle Road, and to the far east is the Old Harrisburg Road. And it would be here on the afternoon of July 1st, 1863, that members of the 11th Army Corps would see some pretty significant combat. And to set the stage for what will happen out here, I think it's important to understand who the men of the 11th Corps were. In many ways, this is a unique uh, part of the Army of the Potomac. And the, uh, the fact of the matter is that many of the men, about 50% in the 11th Corps, were Germans. They were either first-generation German-Americans or recent German immigrants. And because of that, this organization had a very unique kind of ethnic flavor a lot of the Germans in the command, they still spoke German. The officers gave commands in German. They ate weird Germanic food. They read German newspapers. And so here in the Army of the Potomac, which had about 30% of its number as immigrants, uh, you had this very interesting group of individuals. And they had had a really tough history over the course of the previous two years. They're perhaps best known as the uh, Union troops that Stonewall Jackson slams into on May 2nd, 1863, and drives in uh, those men, creating really uh, a catastrophic situation for General Joseph Hooker and the Army of the Potomac. And because of that, because the men were Germans, because they didn't perform particularly well at the Battle of Chancellorsville, they arrive on the battlefield here at Gettysburg with a real significant uh, issue in terms of their morale, and in some cases, in terms of their leadership. And on July 1st, 1863, they're going to have an incredibly difficult assignment. First off, they're commanded by Oliver Otis Howard, who's a well-known figure to most Gettysburg buffs and enthusiasts. And as I'm sure you all now know, because Gary and the crew visited the site earlier, John Fulton Reynolds is killed. Oliver O. Howard will assume command of all Union troops fighting at Gettysburg that day. And what that would mean is that a gentleman by the name of Major General Carl Schurz will take over command of the 11th Army Corps. And Schurz and Howard will make a couple of fairly significant decisions that day. One, I think Oliver Howard recognizes the commanding ground south of town is Cemetery Hill. So he'll take one division, or one third of his strength, in this case von Steinwehr's division, and he leaves it as a rear guard, as, a, as an anchor back on Cemetery Hill. His other two divisions, commanded by Francis Barlow, hence the Knoll, and another individual named Alexander Schemmelfinig, will move through the town of Gettysburg and their initial job, their initial goal, is to actually go up to Oak Ridge and extend the position of the Union Army's First Corps to the right and take Oak Hill. But by the time they move through town, by the time they enter into the plain of Gettysburg, Robert Rhodes' Confederates are already on the summit of Oak Hill, and they receive reports that moving down the Carlisle Road and the Harrisburg Road are Confederates. So now, these maybe 5,000 11th Corps men have to cover roughly a mile of ground between the old Harrisburg Road and the Moomisburg Road. And they simply don't have 
enough men to do it. A lot of their men are spread thin, really in what we would call a heavy skirmish line. There's a lot of space between men, a lot of space between command, uh, commands, and they simply don't have enough men to be able to hold back that, that Confederate force for too long. Uh, Francis Barlow, who's a, a well-known figure in the American Civil War, will actually take it upon himself to lead his command forward and occupy the knoll here. His uh, attention is initially focused kind of off to our northwest where he sees a Confederate brigade. This would be Dole's brigade. But coming down the old Harrisburg Road is going to be a division led by a man named Jubal Early. And to introduce that story, I'm gonna turn it over to my good friend and licensed battlefield guide, Mr. Doug Dowds. Hold on, I'm oh. not Doug, I I'm coming back. I, I often say it's going to somebody else and then I wanna say hello to so many people that are on. Just looking through here, we got New Jersey, we got New York, well, we've got uh, Ohio, Michigan, and somebody from the place I was married, my wife's family place. Williamsport, Pennsylvania, so glad to have you with us. Um, and thanks for that bring, bringing the 11th Corps up, Chris. Here we are on Barlow's Knoll. You're with the American Battlefield Trust. We have a special announcement coming up before this live is over. So I hope you'll hang with us. And now, with no further ado, let's bring the Confederates up with Doug Dowds. All right, gang. So one of the things that Chris talked about is that one of the reasons that the 11th Corps can't take over the position up Oak, Oak Hill is because Richard Stoddard Ewell and the 2nd Corps of the Confederacy have been marching from the north. When they get the orders on June 28th to concentrate at Gettysburg, but don't bring on a battle until they're all together, Ewell's Corps is marching from the north. And what we have up there are the first troops of Ewell's to arrive. That's Robert Emmett Rhodes' division. It's the largest division in the Confederate Army, almost 9,000 men. They've been marching to the sound of the guns since this morning's fight. And one of the things they're going to do is they're going to kick off one of their brigades, George Dole's Georgia Brigade, will come down on this plane to guard their flank as the rest of the division ends up up on Oak Hill or Oak Ridge. That's going to be the position they're going to arrive. So that's the first Confederates there. And it makes sense when we bring the 11th Corps out here that their attention is focused in that direction. Now, ultimately, what's going to happen is that's not all of Richard Stoddard Gould's men. We have Early's division. When the 28th and they get that order to concentrate at Gettysburg, not only are there Confederates up in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, but they're also over by Wrightsville in York. This is Jubal Early's division. He will start to march this way, but not on the same roads. In fact, he's going to be coming down the old Harrisburg Road, which we can see just between those trees. Now, it's going to be later in the afternoon, but after the 11th Corps is established here, all of a sudden they're going to set up an artillery battalion, a 14 cannon that are going to start to shell this position. And then it's going to be troops from Georgia led by John Brown Gordon and some Louisianans that are going to splash across Rock Creek, hit this position in the flank, and ultimately what we're going to see in this action throughout July 1st is this Union line will always break down from right to left. Imagine, for all the Union soldiers that are fighting Confederates to their front, they'll have some Georgians and Louisianans rolling in behind them, and that doesn't work. And so ultimately what they're going to have to do is start falling back across the field, always from right to left, the units falling back in front of them. Now we could talk about some of the things that are out here. When the line starts to collapse, one of the responses is to send a counterattack. The 75th Ohio and the 17th Connecticut. 17th Connecticut that day is led by Lieutenant Colonel Douglas Fowler. He's riding a beautiful white horse. We talked about those 14 artillery pieces that are targeting this position. As Fowler heads over here to try and sure up the right flank, he'll actually turn in the saddle back to his men and say, dodge the big ones, boys. And right about then, a shell will come down, hit Fowler in his head. His head explodes across the front rank of his men. Coupled with all those Union troops retreating back through the line, this is ultimately how this line starts to collapse. And the other thing that we have up here is we have this battery. This belonged to 19-year-old Lieutenant Bayard Wilkerson. His four artillery pieces are dueling with those 14 Confederate pieces. During this exchange of fire, Wilkerson will be hit in the leg by one of those cannonballs. He'll be taken back to the almshouse, which doesn't exist today, and placed in the basement with one of his troopers. While he's down there, the trooper will be begging for water, and what we'll have is Wilkerson will hand over his canteen, and then he'll take out a penknife and he'll amputate his own leg. Now, Wilkerson's not the only Wilkerson his, that's here. His father is here, Samuel Wilkerson. He's the leading reporter with the New York Times, embedded with the Army of the Potomac. So imagine this, the largest battle in the Western Hemisphere, the first on-site report that's going to show up in the New York Times starts like this. Who can tell this story when one's eyes are immovably fixed on a single figure of transcendingly absorbing interest? The dead body of an oldest born son, crushed by a shell in a position where a battery should have never been sent, and abandoned to death in a basement where surgeons dared not stay.
If you think about that impact for the readers of the North to hear that as the opening to the story of the Battle of Gettysburg, you get the idea of Samuel Wilkerson, who was pro-Lincoln, pro-Union, and pro-war until July 1st, 1863. By 1864, he'll be arrested in Lafayette Park, being anti-Lincoln, anti-Union, and anti-war. I'll turn it back over to you, Gary. Wow, I always like following you, Doug. Thanks so much for that. Uh, for, for so many more of you joining us, uh, I really appreciate it. It's good to have Christopher Gwynn joining us, uh, watching right here, as well as uh, our friends Joe Towsley uh, and so many other people. Our friend Wayne Motts from the National Civil War Museum um, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And I want to say, if you want to learn more about Barlow's Knoll, you've got chances. You've got Martin's First Day book. You've got Harry Fonza's First Day book. You can listen to the Battle of Gettysburg podcast, where they have, a, uh, I think, a two- or a nine-parter or something with Stuart Dempsey on the 11th Corps. Or you can watch still online the 7900 part series by Stuart Dempsey on Gettysburg Daily if you'd like but let me bring up uh, Chris White right now because what we just heard is that the Howard came up the Confederates came up and we heard about a couple of the units but I think Chris maybe you can talk a little a little bit about what happens between when they come up and when it unfolds yeah so let's take it from a 20,000 feet view down to about a 500 feet view uh, along this Union line, what's going to start to happen is that this line is going to start to erupt like a volcano. Up on top of Oak Hill, you have Robert Rhodes's division. Uh, nearly 8,000 Confederates who will be making piecemeal attacks largely towards the Union First Corps, towards the Union right flank. Then you will start to pick up steam along the Chambersburg Road, and that will be A.P. Hill coming back to life. His men had fought on the on the opening of the battle. What starts to happen at that point is uh, they, have a, they have a lull, and then here comes Hill. The next thing what we're going to start to see is coming down the road behind us. That'll be Jubal Anderson Early, Lee's bad old man, as he's known, uh, to Robert E. Lee. He's one of two generals in Lee's army that Lee gave a nickname to. The other one is James Longstreet, his old war horse. So Lee is going to start to have a general engagement, even though he doesn't want one. One is coming upon him, forced upon him by his subordinates. What we're going to start to see here is the Union 11th Corps, as Chris mentioned, Chris Gwynn, out in the fields behind me would be a basically a heavy skirmish line. That's going to be commanded by Carl Schertz. He is the 3rd Division commander, now bumped up to the 11th Corps command due to this strange structure that we have out here. He's going to have a number of units basically out there skirmishing with the Confederates that will be at the base of Oak Hill and on top of Oak Hill. Problem that now uh, rears its ugly head for the Confederates, that'll be 10 guns. 10 Union cannon will roll out into battery on that plane below us. Those guns will be commanded by a guy named Wheeler and another one named Dilger. They're going to start to bombard Oak Hill. As they bombard Oak Hill, something is going to happen along the Union lines, and that is the Confederates are going to get mad and fire back. So now the, the Confederates are starting to pay attention to what's happening out here more because there's a lot of accurate Union artillery fire arcing in on top of Oak Hill. As we notice over here off to Dan's right, uh, you're going to see the monument to the 153rd Pennsylvania. The 153rd Pennsylvania is one of the first units to fight out here. Notice it is actually facing towards the west, towards Oak Hill, because Barlow's line it thinks, as Doug pointed out, the threat would be from this direction. In reality, the threat is starting to come down the road. How do we rectify this? We have 6,500 Confederates under the command of Jubal Early starting to roll down towards us. We also have 12 guns of Hillary Jones's artillery battalion starting to go into battery, firing up on top of this hill. That's why Wilkinson's going to be up here with four of his six guns. Barlow's Knoll is not only advanced from the rest of the Union 11th Corps line, most of it being about a quarter of a mile behind us, Barlow up extended past that line, now is exposed. His flanks are both exposed. Off to the left, we have Georgians coming in. Off to the right, we have two cannon. That's it. Christopher Merkel's section of Baird Wilkinson's 11th Corps battery. Wilkinson doesn't want to be here at Barlow's Knoll. He doesn't want to be part of the 11th Corps. He wrote to his father prior to this battle saying, get me out of here. And there's nothing he can do for it. Francis Barlow, the division commander up here, 28 years old, Harvard graduate. He is just a nasty of a cuss of a guy in the 11th Corps. He doesn't like being in the 11th Corps. He doesn't want to be here. He is going to be such a headache on the march north, he is going to start to break down his own unit's morale. He's going to arrest one of his, one of his um, regimental commanders, and that's going to be Douglas Fowler, who's decapitated up here. He's going to arrest Leopold von Gilsa, who's a brigade commander, who is both, the, both of these men will be released by shirts to come out onto the battlefield and fight. Barlow doesn't like that. Barlow doesn't like the Germans. He's very xenophobic against them. So now Barlow has advanced his men really against orders up on top of this high ground. Hillary Jones' 12 guns are firing upon us. As they're firing up here, Wilkinson will fire back. He'll knock out one of those guns. 
three more Confederate guns will be knocked out, not by the Union, but by the Confederates themselves. They'll put the wrong ammunition down the barrel of the guns and plug the guns on their own. Those will be cleared out a little bit later, but Jones, who's 12, 12 days shy of his 30th birthday, is really going to start arcing cannon shells up here. More will start arcing into this area from Oak Hill. Now we have a crossfire taking place. What do we have out in front to defend us? The 153rd Pennsylvania. They're going to put out a skirmish line of two regiments, or I'm sorry, two companies. 153rd, if I'm part of it, I'm asking for my money back because it's a nine-month regiment and they are put on the right flank of the Union Army at Chancellorsville and at Gettysburg. It doesn't go well at either time. These guys are so green here at Gettysburg that they accidentally put their color company out on the skirmish line at first and had to flip-flop that around. Now, the Confederates are going to also entangle with the 17th Connecticut. Four companies, A, B, F, and K, are going to go across the creek. They're going to take up residence in a home that you can't see here, but the American Battlefield Trust helped to preserve. That's the Josiah Benner Farm, 123 acres. These four companies, two guns of Wilkinson's battery, that's all you have between you and Cemetery Hill at one point if you're Jubal Early and you're licking your chops. You're going to unleash John Brown Gordon's Brigade, Harry Hayes' Louisianans, and they're going to roll up here about 2,400 strong versus a division of Union soldiers, 2,400 strong. As they come up over top the Union right flank, they're going to start to bend back this line. Things are not going to go well. Wilkinson goes down, amputating his own leg, as Doug pointed out. Also going down will be Fowler. Next to go down is Francis Barlow. Barlow is going to be on his horseback. His horse is going to start to turn towards the rear, and he's shot in the side, basically gutted by a bullet. He'll go off of his horse, try to stand up to walk to the rear when he's hit by a bullet in the back. It's a spent bullet, but he's knocked down nonetheless. What happens next to Barlow? Two of his men will try to get him off the field. One is wounded, the other one leaves him for dead. Barlow didn't respect his men. His men sure as hell didn't respect him up here on Barlow's Knoll, even though it's named after him today. Barlow's left on the field. Eventually, he's taken to the Josiah Benner farm, where he's inspected by three Confederate doctors and one Union. All say he's mortal. By 1864, he's the head of a second corps division. So doctors back then can be wrong, just like doctors are wrong today. But Barlow is going to have a long road to recovery, but he's out of action. What will happen next? More Union troops will come up into this area. Schertz sees the problem. He's going to try to plug a gap behind Dan. He's going to send in Vladimir Shezhanovsky's brigade. These guys will come pouring forward into the fields, but by the time they're able to deploy, George Doles's Georgians will start to pour down and hit them. Then will come Harry Hayes's men. Then will come John Brown Gordon, and they will start to envelop this position. They're moving so fast that when Hillary Jones, commanding those 12 guns behind us, is going to send forward his reserve battery to place it, plant their guns where we are standing to fire upon the retreating Union soldiers. By the time that battery comes a half mile down the road, goes into battery, there's not an 11th Corps unit out on this battlefield. They're all into the town, heading towards Cemetery Ridge. Another man is going to describe being up here as being in a total crossfire without any sort of cover. If you come up here today, you'll see a lot of trees, but you won't see a lot of cover um, that you see where we are. We have trees behind us, trees behind Dan. Those weren't here at the time. This was much more open in 1863, and this was a perfect crossfire to get caught in, and that's exactly what starts to happen from the west, the north, and the east. Gary? Holy crap, you know, this is like when Barksdale's looking to get into battle and you let him finally get in and man, he explodes. That was awesome. Going into company level detail here. And somebody said, hashtag, how does Chris not sweat? Hashtag, Chris tells it like it is. Um, although these are all Chris with a C, so maybe they meant the other one, I'm not sure. And then um, I like this one. I can't imagine what they smelled like. Are they talking about us or the troops? I smell pretty bad right now. Okay, good, all right. So he does sweat, it turns out. Good, you're with the American Battlefield Trust, if you can't tell. We're on Barlow's Knoll. We're live at Gettysburg 157. We're going to start to make our way towards some of the land that you, the members of this organization, have helped preserve. The 35 acres, uh, you know, about which we're going to have a special announcement. So, Dan, I think we'll just make our way maybe off in that direction. Uh, we're going to be moving toward the Alms House Cemetery. Maybe while we walk, I can put Chris Gwynn sort of on the spot. What's the Alms House and why is there a cemetery there? That's an excellent question. And as Doug mentioned, the Alms House no longer exists today, but it's essentially Gettysburg or this part of Adams County's poorhouse. So if you were hard on your luck, if you had no means to support yourself, you might find yourself a spot at the almshouse. Again, it's not destroyed because of the battle. It's, um, I want to say it's removed in the 1960s, Gary. Yes. 
but uh, I still refer to that distant ridge, which is very slight, back just the edge of the north part of town, I still refer to that as Alms House Ridge. Very if you cool. can see the agricultural center in the distance, that's about where it would have been in 1863. Cool, and I'd actually like to think, you know, so we're gonna get into what the trust uh, owns um, in this area, but uh, but in the meantime, I like to think that even the corner of the Alms House might have been on some of the property, because the Alms House was a sprawling feature. It, it grew over time. So I think that the events that we've talked about, both Falling Back and Baird Wilkerson, um, you know, some of this happened right on the edge of some of this property we're talking about. So if I can drag him away, there's some inside baseball going on behind me, but if I can get Doug Dowds up here, I'm gonna see if he can come on. Uh, Doug, we are starting to get into the field, some of the land owned by the trust, and that we, where the Union soldiers were falling back and making stands along the way. Doug, could you take yeah, this Yeah, so on? it's interesting. You know, we talk about this idea of them falling back here and that uh, it's obviously a tough fight. They're being driven from this position or they would have stayed there. But the idea that they are falling back, and essentially it's not just a pell-mell run for your life, boys. This is a turn around, march back, take a new position when you feel like you have enough interval from the enemy. Then what you're going to do is about face, try and reform before this tidal wave hits you again. And so it's very much this delayed hatching, hitching movement across this field. And so that's what we talk about when we say what fighting takes place in here. This is a delayed response. And in part of this, this is also why General Howard is going to send a brigade from up on Seminary, uh, Cemetery Hill in order to go ahead and provide some support to these men. So it's not a breakneck run, but what it does is provide a little bit of time, which allows some of these men to get off these field. And it's not just pure chaos out here. Other thoughts why we're out here on the field, gang? Yeah, we're, we're going to shift gears a little bit here. Thanks. Thanks, Doug. So let me take a few steps onto this land because this is, we don't want to mess with the farmer, but here we are at the edge of the farmer's field and we are now on American Battlefield Trust land, at least for the moment. Um, you, the members of the organization, helped us preserve um, uh, just a couple of years ago, 35 acres. The cost was $400,000. We couldn't get the normal matching funds we usually could because it was already in the boundary of the Gettysburg National Military Park. So um, due to thousands of members of the trust and supporters, uh, we were able to raise the money for this important piece of land. Imagine this, that the park has not owned the land right next to Barlow's Knoll. There's park property, here's trust property, and this belongs um, in the hands of the National Park Service. Let me just give you an idea of what we're talking about. We're talking about all this land to over there near the old Harrisburg Road where you see those radio towers and some of the traffic over there. Then all the way to the buildings that you see in the distance over there and then beyond the almshouse cemetery over along what we call howard avenue over there all the way over to the carlisle pike so this is a substantial um tract here and i, I wasn't going to use it but i think it is colored on this map here it's basically everything south of barlow's no sorry dan in advance let's see if that works right here all the blue section here is this land that we're talking about okay um you got it so this is clearly where the Union staged, the 153rd, as well as the Union making stands on the way back. Baird Wilkerson uh, was clearly taken back across this particular field here. The Confederates advanced across this particular field here. This was an obvious no-brainer. We're really glad our members came together. And that's why, Chris, if you could come out here real quick, let's uh, switch positions so I can read. Um, I have something here. Uh, ceremonial deed right here about Barlow's Knoll, because guess what's going to happen here? I'm not going to read the whole thing, but Chris... Whereas, during the fighting on July 1st, 1863, the area became known as Barlow's Knoll was from the far right of the federal line. Whereas, uh, sorry, uh, my, uh, our press person, Mary Coyke, wanted me to read this in an old timey voice and maybe raise a finger every time I said whereas. So whereas, Brigadier General Francis Barlow's two brigades initially deployed in the fields before um, before you made a co controversial decision to advance them onto a small rise about 700 yards distance, hoping that the elevation would provide an advantage to his artillery. I'm going to skip about eight whereases here. Whereas this land is hallowed ground and an irreplaceable part of America's heritage to be um, treasured, preserved, and protected for future generations. Now, therefore, it be resolved that today, the 157th anniversary of the fighting that occurred on this property, the American Battlefield Trust hereby ceremonially transfers 35 acres of hallowed ground at Barlow's Knoll to the National Park Service for incorporation into the Gettysburg National Military Park. Thank you so much to the Park Service for accepting this land. Gary, uh, thank you so much to the supporters, to the members of the American Battlefield Trust from the bottom of the hearts of all National Park Service staff here at Gettysburg, we cannot thank you enough. 
Uh, the support of organizations like the American Battlefield Trust, it's, it's not just nice, really it's an imperative. We need your support. We talked a lot about the, the fighting that happened here. We mentioned individuals like Douglas Fowler, like Bayard Wilkson, uh, and the others that fought up here. They have no statue, they have no monument other than the regimental monuments, but the battlefield, the land, as long as we have this, as long as it's preserved, their memories will always be alive here, and that's thanks to you. So again, on behalf of the National Park Service, thank you. And thank you so much. Ooh, look at the big crowd is, is applauding over here. And, and this is really what it's all about. You know, I mean, uh, as long as there's a United States, as long as there's a government to back up uh, the, the whole deed here of the easement, of the protection of this land, this land will be preserved forever. And how many things can you donate to that you know is permanent and, and, and is an important part of how our democracy, how our country was created and defined. So the National Park Service is our number one partner. We make no bones about saying that, even in front of of our other great local and state partners, but this is what we want. We want to preserve the land and then put it in the hands of the Park Service or the appropriate state or local entity where it belongs. So um, to Doug Downs and to Chris White and to Dan Davis behind the camera and to Chris Gwynn and the whole National Park Service, thank you. Thank you for everything you do to help support battlefield preservation and thanks for joining us today.